Um, so welcome everybody to this lunchtime webinar of UDG. Um, it is the first in our mini series looking at housing from a variety of angles. And today we will be looking at family houses and um, sustainability and kind of walkable neighborhoods, all shaped around the kind of the house rather than the block of flats. Um, then next week on the 17th of May, we have um, some we have some general reflection on housing from Ben Derbyshire. And we will also hear from Hani Sali um, from the Quality of Life Foundation, who will talk a little bit more about the residents' perspective in terms of housing. And we hope to confirm other speakers as well. Then beginning of June, we will hold an event on higher density housing. And Andrew Barrell from PTE will talk about deck access and mention blocks. And then the last in the series we hope to put on is really kind of picking up on council-led housing and picking up on latest magazine, which you should all have received. If you've not, that means you're not a member of the UDG and you should become one ASAP because that means you get all the magazines on a quarterly basis and, you know, you kind of get all the info about our events and what we do. And as always, we also need your support to kind of push forward with our agenda of creating better places. Um, so why housing? Housing, our homes, they really make up the majority of the buildings. In England, we have something like 25 million dwellings which probably means that 94% or so um, of the buildings in England are homes. Um, I'm sure somebody out there has kind of more detailed stats of how many homes we have, but it is a lot and it is a big percentage of our um, and kind of rural environments. And I think it demonstrates how important these buildings are, not only for the individuals and the families living in them, but also kind of in terms of shaping our overall built environment. The TCPA has been campaigning for healthy homes for many, many years. And we've also had research from Place Alliance, the NHS, and many others that provide the evidence to show that poor quality homes really have a very negative impact on our health, our society, the economy as a whole, and obviously in terms of how we want to kind of actually meet our zero carbon aspirations. So all of that can be traced back to the quality of the homes and the places we build. Unfortunately, often homes, housing are not the focus of attention and are not given the care they require in regard of design and construction quality or how they are assembled to create these great places where people want to live. Many housing developments, especially those outside urban cores, do not live up to expectations and do not create the homes and neighborhoods that people need. And that has been very clearly demonstrated in kind of research coming out of the RTPI that showed that many of the housing developments given planning consent nowadays are actually not placed in accessible location and at lower densities and that really do not encourage kind of inclusive, sustainable, healthy lifestyles. I mean, why we are doing this, there are lots and lots of reasons, and we will come back to that later. I mean, there are a number of reasons. It's the way we buy and sell land, the nature of our development industry, the way we plan for new housing, and that's just mentioning a few. The majority of the new neighborhoods that are built on greenfield sites tend to be lowish densities that not enable and encourage life, sustainable lifestyles, walking and cycling. Um, and it also doesn't help us to kind of meet our national zero carbon objectives. So housing is really absolutely critical to meeting all of the government objectives and to kind of create better lives for us all. And I guess when I say higher densities, that doesn't mean building tall or lots of tiny homes. It means in a way rediscovering the beauty of our terrace built for terrace forms. And, you know, the kind of more denser urban family housing and reinventing them and bringing them into the 21st century. And developing family houses that are suitable for today's needs and that go beyond the kind of standard semi-detached house with two parking spaces that we see all over the country. 
because that is incredibly land hungry and doesn't really deliver on the aspiration. So I think we also need to look carefully at the homes we build as well as the public ground we design around it. And in this mini series, we want to share knowledge and examples of developments and house types that could become a new standards. Um, these could become the key ingredients for the new sustain sustainable suburbs, but also the infill on kind of more urban sites. And luckily, we have some very highly qualified and talented designers that have turned their hands and their imagination to designing excellent homes for many, many years. And today we will hear from some of them. So this is enough for me. Over to our first speaker, which is Stephen Proctor from Proctor and Matthew Architects. And his firm is well known and has made a virtue of designing homes and developing new house types that addresses today's challenges. So Stephen, over to you. Thank you. I hope everyone can see that. Has that come up on the screen okay, Katja? It has, yeah. Okay, okay. Th well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, about family house types and the relationship to um, livable neighbourhoods. Um, I suppose ooh, it's not working. Oh, here we go. That's better. Um, so as a practice, um, I suppose we've always been interested in the, the relationship um, between the public realm um, spaces of the neighbourhood and the private realm of the um, of the of the home um, and the threshold um, between the places of interaction and the places of retreat and contemplation. Um, the separation or dislocation that all too often exists between the disciplines of master planning and architecture, and in, in particular, the specific design of homes has always um, been a bit of a concern for us. And so uh, when um, Katja asked, uh, me to talk about family house types to meet the 21st century living patterns and aspirations. It's um, it's sort of always difficult not to return to Gordon Cullen's observation that people live in houses, but where do houses live? If they are homeless, then all we are left with is the typical um, endless, featureless suburbia. Um, so I suppose we've we've challenged ourselves to identify a series of key aspirations, and I'm not going to read them all. Um, the, these sort of guide our attitude towards the design of new new neighbourhoods, um, and which make a dis direct and distinct connection between house type design and neighbourhood form. And, and I suppose that's all in the search for this sort of idea of a narrative of place. So I apologise to those who attended my the uh, last joint um, design group talk I did with Stephen Willisy and Dundee a few months ago. I'm, I am going to show some of the same designs, in fact, some of the same drawings, um, but hopefully today I'll try to confine the comments to the design of family house types and not neighbourhood identity in place, but I'm, I'm sure it's going to be very difficult. So, of course, um, as a studio, we're interested in the design of house types to respond to contemporary living patterns. Uh, we look to design types which help to increase densities and to make neighbourhoods more sustainable, a sort of more efficient use of land, and to do this without impacting detrimentally on the surrounding landscape and contact. We're also interested in the relationship between internal living space and external amenity space, looking for ways of extending seasonal use um, of all external areas. Um, and I suppose like all conscientious designers of housing, we obsess about how to integrate service intake cupboards, bike storage and refuse storage, and minimize the visual impact um, on streetscapes and the thresholds to each home. We look to design flexible and adaptable layouts, places for home working, for example, here, uh, maximizing the use of often neglected spaces within the home. Here is part of the home circulation at one of the houses at Abode at Great Night, which I'm going to talk about later. We also look to incorporate ideas that we've developed for specific housing sectors to future-proof general needs housing, 
ideas for combating loneliness in homes for later living. And this one's a, a project at Tetbury, completed a few years ago. And the ideas here can find their ways into the non-specific general needs um, housing projects. And I suppose here with the, the, the discussion really is about the form of clustering houses around courtyards to encourage a sort of a feeling of communality. But alongside that, we also explore ways of creating neighbourhoods which have a clear identity and create a sense of place. House types which can define settlement edges with, without resorting to neighbourhood boundaries of endless B&Q back garden fences or the default position of one-sided perimeter roads, um, which interrupt the potential relationship between the home and the surrounding landscape, and which, after all, are somewhat uneconomic and are hardly an efficient use of land or expensive hard surface materials come to that. Um, we're also interested, and, and the, these, these house types are deliberately designed here for a, a project in, in um, North Stowe um, for an edge condition. Um, so they, they sort of weave in and out along a defined edge of the neighbourhood. Um, we're also interested in contemporary house types which uh, respond to specific issues of context. Homes which can be clustered differently to respond to topography, landscape forms and proximity, um, form, landscape forms of proximity and the need for shelter in exposed environments. This one is at, at Horstead Park in, in Kent on quite an exposed escarpment edge. And here are the, the house types which developed, in a sense, developed a series of houses with side gardens, which I'm going to talk about later when I, I talk about one of the big case studies. Um, this was a project um, for an exploration of, of modern methods of construction methodologies. Um, it's called Smart Life, and it was shocking to hear that it was completed 15 years ago. Um, it seemed like only yesterday. Um, in, in the Fenlands, in March in Fenlands. And this was really about devising house types which could be clustered to respond to um, patterns of existing settlement grain, you know, the burgage plots, those long thin yards of Fenland villages and towns. Here there's an analysis of them in, in Chatteris. And this is the final um, layout that was built um, in March. Or even um, new types um, to create contemporary interpretations of ancient um, sort of regional spatial typologies. Um, you know, we, we all sort of hear as you go around the country, the, the snickets of Oldham, the, the Gants of Braintree, or these long thin lanes, the Ginnells of northern and midland towns, the Twittons and Cat Creeps of Hastings, Brighton and the South Coast. And this is, this is a, a, a recent study actually that we're, it's a current project. So um, I haven't shown that one before, but that's really looking at the way in which we can use new types to sort of interlock to form a different kind of public realm environment. Well, here at, at Mountfield Park, um, in Canterbury, on the on the southern edge of Canterbury, responding to the orthogonal grid of shelter belts and um, hop fields or, or orchards uh, in Kent and clustering homes in a different way. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, about um, two projects in a little bit more detail. Um, the second one is um, is sort of ongoing work in Ireland for the volume house builder Glen Vey, which is um, one of the projects currently on site. And th this grew, this work grew out of of um, house type investigations that we carried out on the first project, which is at, at um, abode at Great Knight and on the southern fringe of Cambridge, which I'm going to talk about as well. Um, the, the, that, that, the first, that, that first project, the, 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 um, abode scheme is a sort of, I suppose has been well documented because we were very fortunate to win the inaugural, um, Architecture Today Award for buildings which stand the test of time because I think it's, it's been occupied since, um, parts of it since 2012. So really just to, um, 
sort of start the the that discussion this this is a sort of conventional suburban street it's one that is often built this this from examples in ireland and i just i thought it was just worth identifying what, where the problems really lie um so you've got a a, a sort of terrace of parallel terrace of, of houses with parking two car parking spaces per dwelling mostly on the frontage um, and back-to-back uh, -back distances, sort of habitable room to habitable room distances of 22 metres. And, and when we're looking to increase densities, of course, this is the real challenge. When you look at the street on the right there, you can understand why this isn't a place for children to play. It has no sense of enclosure. Um, and if you look at the sort of the built form, this is one just sort of currently under construction, you know, approximately 30 square metres per house at the front of that, uh, of, of the front of the house is sort of lost to cars and service requirements um, and sort of access by the front of your, your car. So the first project, Abode at Great Knighton, um, is um, on the southern fringe of Cambridge. Um, you can read all the statistics there, 40% affordable homes with 60% of family dwellings, but delivering quite high densities. Um, and this was really the, the plan of that first phase of Great Night, and which of course is a wider um, neighborhood of, of getting up for 3000 new homes. Um, and I suppose what I wanted to do is to talk about how we could deliver those densities without without having a, a large number of apartments. So the basic concept was to start with a sort of formality of a square, which sort of tried to tame an existing roundabout going to Adam Brooks Hospital, then falling back towards the plantation uh, on the edge of that drawing there um, with a series of new streets and then these long, thin, fine grain, um, we call them green lane um, terraces reaching out to the plantation. Now we've got it in a little bit more detail. And I wanted to just to first talk about getting those densities, how we can actually achieve more family homes um, within a small area. So this is the frontage to the, um, that great court around the roundabout with family homes at the base. Um, so you see the, the plan of those top left and the section at the bottom there. So above the family homes are apartments and apartments above the parking to the rear of the the um, uh, section there. And, the, and I suppose all this project is about um, maintaining privacy of private amenity space. So the apartment looks out into the great court. It has high level windows that let light in um, on the opposite side of the apartment. But the house below it has a total privacy within its courtyard as the apartment, the, the, the flat over the, the garage looks into the mews. Then moving through into the mews streets, we developed a series of house types there, which again, looked to challenge those back-to-back -back distance. So we're talking before about 22, sometimes 20, 25 meters between habitable rooms. Here we were down to 12, just over 12 um, meters um, between the facades of buildings to the rear. And we achieved that by, by creating two um, living space as a family living space and dining area on the ground floor opening out to a garden and then on the first floor uh, where you've got a little bit more of a, a private retreat of a, a uh, living space you have a courtyard terrace um, and the bedrooms look out into that so they're not looking across the neighbour and I suppose all this is about sort of the careful consideration of the types in order to meet those densities. And then moving further into the um, the green lanes, um, we we sort of picked up on the on the grain of local sort of vernacular agricultural buildings, these sort of long thin uh, bordered buildings, and there's something quite intriguing about a, a sort of thin house. I mean, you're you're, you're filling the, the the house with with daylight. Um, on, from, from both sides, but you can actually control which side you open. Um, uh, and 
and give an aspect to. And so all these houses actually have side gardens. They're deliberately designed so that they, um, constructionally, they're the same width. So um, in terms of the construction details and procurement of trusses and things like that, they're all the same. And so there, there you can see the benefits, I think, of this sort of narrow house. It's a wide front to the street, um, but a long and thin house that has direct access out into the gardens um, from all the living spaces on the ground floor. And I think that's sort of that's that offers the benefit beyond a conventional terrace house when often you only get a living room or a kitchen that has access to the garden. Um, Again, so they're, they're moving from the, the Muse Street into the, um, the Green Lanes. And then those, those sort of ribbons of landscape with, with doorstop play um, for children on the way to school. You just see that on the, on the um, right-hand side there, various objects on springs. Um, and, um, and those have become sort of really interesting green threads that bring landscape to everyone's doorstep. Obviously, it's a better day than today when those photographs were taken. And, and then sort of almost like that North Stowe example, we were sort of obsessed about the idea of avoiding the B&Q garden fence to the landscape. Here we, know, we knew we had a sort of a hard um, boundary edge to deal with onto a plantation. The plantation is publicly accessible. So all those, those houses um, sort of sit on top of the garden walls that, that exist between the houses. And then um, a completely different kind of, of dwelling uh, as you move further into the development. These, these sort of challenge the, the notion that you always have to have a ground level garden and private amenity space. These have, have a frontage or a threshold, as you can see on the left there to the street, but it's not really usable as an amenity space. It's more of a buffer to the, to the, um, the main village street. Um, but on the, on the top right there, you can see the um, terraces um, that exist on centrally in each home and then on the top floor of each home. These are um, three bedroom houses. Um, and I suppose that in terms of the, their, their type, we were always told that they'd be the last to sell because um, they didn't have gardens, they were actually the first to sell and people queued up to buy them. So there's a sort of an interesting discussion about amenity space, whether it's better to make more usable amenity space. Here we've got um, terraces off the two um, top floor bedrooms. So each bedroom has a terrace. So you can imagine that, that would be very useful for sharers. Um, and so there's a certain amount of flexibility within that. And then the central terrace is at the first floor level. Um, then again, we were challenging densities here. We have four bedroom um, houses back to back with two bedroom houses. So almost like those sort of northern back to back terraces that you see in industrial landscapes. Um, these were a, a sort of a, a, a take on that where each house um, has a, again has a side garden or um, terraces and, and ground level courtyards. And I think in terms of, of making this is so this is one of the Muse streets, you've got those um, gardenless homes on the right, three bedroom homes on the right, and then on the left, little two bedroom Muse houses. And it's quite interesting to us to, to going back continually to sort of know that every year this this particular street is closed um, for street parties. Um, so um, it obviously sort of works quite well as a as a sort of a, a place for to interact with neighbours. There on the right, you see those back to back configurations, and of course, a lot of care is taken um, to make sure there's no overlooking. So the placement of windows varies depending on how these houses are clustered together. And then finally, here, um, this is probably one of the most dense parts of the neighbourhood. It, it looks out with the largest homes. It looks out onto um, the Hobson's Brook um, Country Park um, with houses that, again, you can see um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the top left there, uh, the terraces that face onto that landscape are quite small. But there are a series of 
of terraces on the upper levels, which co which compensate. Um, I think what what was interesting, we, we're told that you you know an average house builder, I think, is getting about sort of fifteen to twenty thousand square feet per acre, and here we're getting thirty six to forty three thousand square feet per acre. So there's a, a real density um, in this. Um, and for a sort of high value location, it's not always dependent on um, large gardens. Then just quickly moving to um, the second project, which um, started as, as a, a, a commission to look at um, a new suite of house types for Glen Vey as a house builder in Ireland. And we were immediately drawn to um, away from that, that standard product and to something that gave a much more sort of collective um, communal um, flavor to the streetscape. So this is a, a traditional, um, I think in, in Ireland, they pronounce them as Clahans. In Scotland, it's Clacken. Um, and um, about grouping houses around a communal space. So just to refresh, that was that, that typical suburban cluster that we were trying to avoid. And on the right, looking at a suite of, of houses that could be assembled in many different ways. And I'll talk about those a little bit more. So there's the, um, uh, the, the same area as that uh, typical suburban cluster, increasing densities, but also you're getting communal spaces within this. Um, you're getting more privacy in your private spaces, private amenity spaces, um, and there is a, a, a sort of... A, a, a feeling of community generated by the way of those houses are clustered. So some of a lot of the thoughts from Great Night and are beginning to emerge here. Very different price um, point um, in the market in Ireland, much lower price point than Cambridge. Um, and so we work very closely with the um, sales team and the construction team at Glenvey to evolve these. So these are some of the early iterations. You can see one of those courtyard houses there uh, located in the cluster. Some of the early plans. I think it's sort of fair to say that that you know we're talking about sustainability and making a sort of high performance of of dwellings. Um, here we looked at building over carports, but of course then you're having to insulate against unheated spaces around the car. So um, and that's quite a, an expensive thing to do. So we then moved on from this to look at terraces over carports, um, which we'll see in a, in a short while. But of course, the parking, taking the cars off plot so you don't sterilize that 30 square meters in front of the home, you can tighten the streets down. We're now getting down from 22 meters to 8.9 meters um, on the development that we're building at the moment in Tyrrellstown. And um, but the advantage is, of course, is if it's in curtilage, the parking, that you can get rapid charging points a lot easier. You can future proof um, the, the streets um, in that way. And um, it also means that if it's in line parking, one car behind the other, then you can discourage those and sort of unnecessary short car journeys because it's a little bit of a hassle to get your second car out beyond the first. So these are some of those those um, spaces. I'll do this quickly. I don't know how many minutes I've got left, Katya. Am I okay for time? Um, another three to five. Okay, so oh, that's good. Okay, so so th so this is the idea of the um, courtyard um, living. There's something about the way in which you can sort of tessellate different typologies within a master plan with an L-shaped house because you can position, uh, when they're close together, you can position the windows into the courtyard or out to the street. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a sort of, a, that's, that's quite important when you're beginning to assemble a plan like this. With This is at a, 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 an existing site in uh, Lexlip um, in Ireland. And um, again, de delivering about 40 dwellings per hectare, but with 82% family homes. And of course, the problem at the moment in, in Ireland is that um, we're, they, they have targets of 40 plus. Um, there's no market for the apartments in those suburban areas. So what happens is the planning permissions are delivered with an area cordoned off for apartments that are never built. 
So the housing gets built, but the, house, the apartments don't. So everybody loses out. So these are some of the um, little townscape drawings of the kind of, of um, environment that those can, clusters can deliver. So these were the so the, working with the team at Glenvay to um, make a, an affordable product um, for the for the volume house builder. Here we've got the two and three bedroom units. We're looking for ways of incorporating uh, home working in all those homes. But you can see that um, by having a, a terrace to the side over on the on the three bedroom unit over the um, the cars that you can actually begin to place windows strategically around the plan. And the same with the four bedroom house type and the sort of L shaped form of that, which is, is proving to be very adaptable. And it goes back to the idea of the, the edge houses that we looked at at North Stowe. This is very workable in that situation, which you hopefully you'll see in a minute. Going through planning in um, in Ireland is interesting. So their standard product, irrespective of orientation, nobody asks any questions about how much sunlight or daylight you get in a north facing garden, um, where you know that you're only going to be able to use the, the lower end of, of, that, uh, of that garden um, in, in certain hours of the day. So here we demonstrated that um, by moving the terraces, a combination of courtyards, first floor and second floor terraces that we could actually track the sun um, at all times during the day. And I think it was what was interesting is the, um, the feedback that we were getting from a, um, a focus group saying that, that that was carried out during COVID that actually the idea of different kinds of external space in the summer was actually quite um, useful, home working on the upper terrace and children playing in the courtyard. And this that, that, that was really one of the outcomes of this particular um, piece of, of research that was carried out across Ireland. And I think it was also interesting to hear that a lot of those sort of future residents were interested in the spaces of interaction, the spaces within the neighbourhood. And so the way in which houses can engage with, with the neighbourhood is very important. So this is the project that is, is on, currently on site, um, a very difficult, long, thin tapering site um, on the edge of Tyrrellstown, um, which is a new neighbourhood in the flight path of Dublin, um, city airport. Um, uh, you can see from these diagrams how sort of complex it is. We've got pylons, uh, high level um, uh, electricity pylons running on the on the sort of tapering end of the site um, and um, a landscape to the north, a, an open common to the south. Um, and so we're felt trying to make those connections through that. So these are some of those early, early sketches. And you can see on that left-hand side the way we're sort of juggling with those typologies, uh, twisting and being assembled in different ways to form different kinds of um, clahans, these sort of communal spaces. So the diagram bottom right there looks at a um, productive garden in the centre um, and a more public um, clahan um, when uh, of number two. Okay, Stephen. Yep. You... Okay, I'm winding up now. Here we go. Okay. And so this is the um, uh, those early drawings showing those L-shaped houses and the central clan. The importance of entrances within the street, but you can see how the streets are becoming much tighter, much more conducive to sort of shared surface. Uh, treatment in the landscape and it's denuded of landscape at the moment but this is the final image of the um of this the project evolving on site thank you very much right thank you Stephen. thank you for sharing all the kind of hard work that has gone into or the output of all that hard work that has gone into developing these house types and i think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from and I bet a lot of people would like to kind of look at the house types much more closely. I mean, there are lots of um, 
specific questions in the chat so maybe you can answer them or you can answer them separately about the research if it's available the cost how many parking spaces and and so on um, but we can pick some of the kind of more strategic questions up later um now i want to hand over to Anneli. really happy to have Anneli richies from michael richies here and I think, you know, they're well known for their Sterling Prize winning Norwich development and um, also the work they're doing with the City of York in particular and providing zero carbon environmental kind of really highly sustainable homes and um, affordable homes as well as that. So, Anneli, please go ahead. Thanks, Katja. Um, let me try and share. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to talk about something slightly different, um, which is really focusing on sustainability in family housing and talking a lot about the research we've done on our projects um, to see how successful they've been in their kind of performance. Um, so slightly different tack. Um, our journey into looking at sustainable housing started with a project called Clayfield, which was for um, Orwell Housing Association. It was going to be 100% for social rent, fuel poverty was a big issue even then, God knows what it's like now. Um, but really we teamed up with Bureau Happel to find out how we could reduce people's fuel bills. And they they suggested facing everything south and trying to harness um, low winter sun, which is 15 degrees. And it's quite hard to make a scheme actually that faces south and all the homes get winter sun. But by this kind of modeling of the section, we managed to achieve that. Um, and, and to stop um, taller buildings um, overshadowing smaller buildings, there's space behind them. This was the very first ever SketchUp model we made to try and test it and it works. And I think one of the things that we benefited from massively was Bureau Happel decided to do a really in-depth post documentary analysis on it to find out if it worked. I mean, this is pre all the Passive House modeling programs, which we have now. So. They did a year study on it, um, monitored every window for um, solar gain and and found out that a lot of things actually um, about human behavior. It's a really interesting study, but I can't really go into it now. But one of the things, the kind of takeaways we got was that the heat loss from these buildings and the heating required was significantly less than was predicted. Um, so, I mean, that almost never happens. Um, it wasn't the same for water use and electricity, you know, lighting and stuff, but for, for the performance of the buildings, they performed a lot better than expected in terms of heat loss. So therefore reducing fuel poverty. Um, so, oh, I've got some graphs, I won't go into those. <laughs> um, and when it came to Goldsmith Street, that was a, another competition for social housing again. Um, and we thought, well, we know it works on, on Clayfield, we know a solar scheme works and it will reduce fuel bills. So let's try and design one at high density and see if we can get it. I mean, this is about 87 dwellings per hectare. So it's it's a significant, a significant density. Um, the, the location was very close to um, a Norwich city centre. So you can see the castle. Um, Active travel was a big part of the brief. It was an ambitious brief, which is always great to get. Um, but also we noticed it was very close to the um, uh, gold and silver triangle. It's a kind of housing, it's a late Victorian housing that's very popular and where people would choose to live. And as it turns out, it's quite high density housing with 14 meter streets, 14 meters back to back and and so I suppose we were kind of querying why we can't build this nowadays. And as we all know, it's because of the overlooking distances that are required, which create these massive streets and really seriously impact our ability to provide housing at density, which I think is really important <laughs> for the housing crisis. So we, we, we wondered, could we replicate these, um, these, uh, these distances in Goldsmith Street? And... We knew that we weren't going to be able to get over the 21 metres overlooking distance, so we decided to face all the build, all the rooms the same way. So all habitable rooms bar one room, which is a ground floor living room, face south. This also worked really well with our passive solar um, 
scheme as well. We modeled the roofscape so that they didn't overshadow each other. And so we we had a passive solar scheme. We we actually could provide quite high density. So we won the competition by providing more houses than anyone else that had entered it um, by challenging these distances and trying to find a way around it. And it fitted really well on the site, which was a relief. <laughs> um, so we've managed to provide these really simple terraces of houses with 14 meter distances. And, and they are kind of connected by these social spaces either private, semi-private or open um, bits of landscape for the community to use. So at some point in this in the process, our clients, Norwich City Council, asked if we could do passive house. And we had never done passive house before. Obviously we said yes, but um, that really realizing what it would entail. They wanted to do a passive house scheme, not, not because of the um the carbon issue but because they they were talking to Hasto Housing Association who were um, building a lot of homes in East Anglia and they built some trial passive house projects and they'd found that the tenants in those projects were significantly less likely to default on rent because they had no fuel bills. So they, they came at it from an economic point of view, really, because of the hassle of trying to find, you know, replace tenants. And also there was reportedly a significant benefits to people's health. Um, so that, that's why they wanted to go for a passive house scheme. It was it was easier for us to convert uh, to do a passive house scheme because we had a passive solar scheme. It's um, I think the key principles I'm sure everyone knows it's about really about um, insulation, air tightness, having an MVHR system, um, and also what's quite interesting about the passive house model is it does look at overheating. So. Um, it, it, it really is an approach to a building fabric. Um, and, you know, we discovered we, sh we needed to shade the windows. So we have these shading devices. Um, we've got the walls are 600 mil thick. Um, so we, we've, we've designed a lot of the detailing around trying to make openings in these really thick walls and splay them. And um, so it did have a slightly different approach. So here's the south facing terrace. Because they've got a north facing garden, they actually, um, to the back, they, we've actually given them quite a big south facing garden, which all, they're using a lot. We often see people sitting out there, people's washings out there. So they got a bit of front garden, whereas the north facing terraces, which clearly have less glazing because of um, the passive house um, program, they're hard up on the, against the street. And so really we've tried to kind of make the most of every single corner of this with these kind of densities it has to work really hard so we have a cold outer skin to the buildings and these these form the entrances and places for post boxes um i think one of the brave things norwich did was put these kind of we're, we're, we're calling them ginnels here but i i think that's a northern term but these alleyways at the back these kind of enlarged spaces for residents to meet and they proved incredibly successful it was a very brave decision to do because I don't think people really worry about this kind of unmanaged space but um one of the residents um a few a few weeks ago we were there and one of the residents said they can't wait for their child for the sub summer because they've just had a they've got a two-year-old and they'll be able to go and play out there um and that's them I mean they, they're not big spaces um at all and we tried to managing privacy is complex i mean we've we kind of carefully set the heights of the fences some people have filled in the gaps because they want to be more private but that's fine and generally they're they're really well used um and this is just a view of one of the um the other the open spaces and finally if you looking up we've i mean i'm not really going to talk about typologies but we we developed a, a flat typology where everyone had their own front door and again people so there's no common parts in this scheme which from a council perspective is is great in, in terms of management and they've also proved to be um, really popular. So just in terms of, you know, how's it working? Well, we had a passive house model. It takes quite a long time to build a model in the program. And we decided to use that to just see whether our assumptions were correct. You know, we, we designed, we hadn't designed a passive house scheme. We designed a passive solar scheme. So was that was that the right starting point? So we took our model and we rotated it to see whether or not this idea that you could harness winter sun 
um, to help fuel bills was correct. And the blue line, and this is two different bits of data on the same graph, so it's a bit confusing, but the blue line shows the benefits of facing south. So you do use less energy, about one kilowatt hour per meter squared per annum. So that that's a that's that's a help, you know, that 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 reduces costs. And, and this was really what we wanted to do. We wanted to try and work out how we could make this kind of performance building affordable for local authorities. So it's definitely a benefit uh, face south, but not as much as we thought. I think the real surprise and even um, Warm, who did this for us, were quite shocked by this was the overheating risk. Um, the overheating risk increases massively beyond comfort levels if you face it east and west. And now obviously you can shade east and west, but it's more difficult than from the south and it's more costly. So th this was very interesting. Um, we also looked at um, overshadowing. Um, again, it's obviously there is a increased energy demand if you're in shade, but again, the, the magic number for passive house is 15. So you can, it, it, it does work. Obviously the less overshadowing you have, the, the less you spend on insulation. Um, but we appreciate high density schemes struggle with this issue. And the other one was form factor, you know, how many terraces are an ideal number for, for having a good form factor. A single house is obviously, you know, harder to make passive houses, not impossible, but you're just paying for more insulation. Uh, once you're past six, um, five or six uh, houses in a row, it, there really is no benefit. So actually this was um, kind of fed into our work later for York. Um, why build passive house? Well, this is just really looking at the CO2 emissions for a building regs building and a passive house building. So you can see after 30 years, that's a lot of carbon. And, you know, what do the residents think? Well, the, the Guardian did an article recently. They went down and, and talked to the residents and some say that they were not even having to, they had never turned their heating on. Um, we They called it life-changing and we've had letters from residents saying that they've invited people around to their house the first time. They're no longer reliant on food banks because of this. Um, so we did our own post-occupancy analysis. We asked people to fill in the questionnaire. 10% did, which is a bit disappointing. Um, and we need to work out how we can get more people involved with this. But generally, there's that there are health benefits, um, definitely improvements in sense of well-being. Um, and interestingly, people are using active travel a lot more. Um, so on to York. Well, um, this is a, a housing program. York were quite, and this is a really unusual thing that they wanted a housing framework with one architect on. They've got nine sites and they want to be able to learn through a process and they want to use one architect to do that, which is really unusual. Um, and one of the first things they did was um, produce a um, design manual um, with a set of really simple um, aspirations. So healthy homes and neighborhoods, it, reducing impact on the environment and so saving en on energy bills, delivering the housing our residents need, which has been quite interesting, um, sustainable transport choice and connectivity and distinctive, beautiful places. Um, the, it, I mean, interestingly, they, they were, they were a, a Lib Dem Green Council and the political will was there before we were, we were involved. Um, and they set the net zero target for all new homes. Now to get to net zero, you, you really do need to, to be at Passive House because you need you then you need to make up the in-use energy against renewables on site. So the more energy you need in use, the more renewables you need, and there's only so much roof you've got um, to do it. And another kind of key thing was they wanted to measure embodied carbon throughout the design process. So, um, so decisions about materials were made on a carbon and cost basis. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's, it's a kind of, these are the sites we're working on at the moment. Um, two are on site, one's about to go on site, others are at feasibility stage. But there is a kind of joined up thinking that links kind of transport, 
parking strategies across across the whole city, which is which is great. Um, just going to talk about one of them, which is um, Ordnance Lane. This is the one that's um, being tendered at the moment. And I think this is probably the most ambitious in terms of kind of community housing. Um, it's it's a scheme that is a very mixed, it's, it's quite near the centre of York. It's connected to the cycle routes. Um, it's, it's on a major kind of high street, so there's buses and so here there was really kind of not much parking needed um, and a good active travel plan. But there was existing buildings on site, um, which we are refurbishing. And the idea is this is gen a genuinely mixed community. So we've got lots of different housing types and we had a really extensive public consultation. And a lot of these types came out of that. So there was a real need in the area for multi-generational homes. And these are homes where you um, are supporting a family member who um, wants to live independently, but does need some care from the family. Well, there was a lot of people who need this kind of house. We developed a typology in consultation with the community on these. The other one was intergenerational homes. These are, these are homes for um, older people who feel isolated and um, young postgraduates. There's not much postgraduate housing. Um, for people who've just left university. So um, there's a, these are alongside kind of community areas like a cafe. Um, and, and the intergenerational living is has got real strong ideas about stewardship. I think you could um, teamed up with Edible York to do um, to do growing food on the site and a community cafe. And um, then the multi-generational, housing is um onto this kind of active travel network so so there's a there's a route car free route that goes through the site that these have direct access onto and they also share the kind of the back the big back gardens that would have spaces to grow your own food and these are really their their family houses above um a kind of a, fl a flat that can be separated or part of the home depending on on the use um, I'm just going to end with a provocation, really, um, which is uh, just what, what are we building at the moment? So, um, you know, I think this is generally the kind of house, this is most of the housing in the UK looks like this. And this is this is one of the volume house builders. I don't know where it is, but I just Googled aerial shot new housing and, and this came up as one of the first. So we did a kind of bit of an analysis about it uh, on it um, to look at what the land use is for these kind of homes. Um, so it's very crude because we um, it's done off a photograph, but really this kind of gives us an idea of that these are the homes. It's about 25 dwellings per hectare. Um, and this is the green space. Now that looks quite a lot, but most of it is actually verge um, and not really usable. I mean, the back gardens are small and that that's, that, that's the tree. Um, and this is the place as a pedestrian where you can wander freely without being worried about being mown over a car. So you have priority here as a pedestrian. This is where the cars have priority. This is where they're allowed to move freely. And this is everything else. This is the playgrounds, the schools, the, the you know, ev everything else, the bus stop, the active travel network. And, you know, this, is, this equates to, um, you know, the volume of area we give over to cars. So now we do this kind of analysis for all of our projects and we're aiming to get this with good design, with good careful design, you can um, half, at least half the amount of space given over to cars without losing parking spaces and give it to other community uses. And But unfortunately, it's, you know, these schemes can get planning. The planning system allows for these projects to be built without question. Um, so that's my, that's my provocation, really. How do I escape that? Thank you, Annalie. I think excellent examples and very, I mean, your last visuals, I mean, they're really, I mean, nobody can argue with that, isn't it? It just brings home the point. 
Um, I mean, I was while well, you were going through it, kind of, and also the analysis about the length of a terrace and the energy consumption. And, you know, I've heard from so many house builders that they never do a terrace over three. You know, three houses is maximum they or any, you know, put into a terrace. Um, and I hope that, you know, some of these examples and some of those statistics that it actually makes commercial sense as well will hopefully start shifting something in the way we deliver our homes. Um, so now to the last speaker, and then we have time for Q&A. We are aiming to be, kind of be finished at, at 1 uh, 2.30. So Jas um, is the next speaker, and um, he has been undertaking some research into walkable neighborhoods and also has thought about the kind of modern interpretation of terrace houses. And I think he has done some analysis on Stevens and Annalise's work, which will be quite interesting to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks, Katja. Um, and thanks, Stephen. Uh, Anneli is super interesting stuff, which um, is really, really well linked to the things I'm going to talk about so much so that you'd think we planned it all, which we did for the purpose of the recording. Um, I'd, so uh, just briefly a bit about, um, hopefully, can you see my screen? I'm assuming you can. Um, yes, we can. Just, yeah, just a bit about us um, in case we've not come across uh, my practice before and the work we do we do um, we're a small practice based in southwest London we do a lot of um, retrofit um, and, and small housing but actually uh, our passion very much and our um, expertise is in large-scale master planning um, urbanism owing to, to my background as a, as a town planner um, and we yeah so we're, we're very interested in in improving um, what I'd call the ordinary housing stock so trying to um, deliver better homes and places uh, because, you know, as I said in Catch's introduction, new housing makes up the vast, vast amount of, of new building that comes forward. But for some reason, uh, architects, designers as a profession, uh, uh, architects and, and designers more widely are just not involved with, with the vast majority of housing that comes forward. Um, uh, and that's why most housing looks like this or this or this or this, where um, it, it, you know, you get small, subtle deviations in in color, in facade treatment, even in, in you know, uh, ornament. But really, they are the same sort of car based, low density, but below 32 dPH, uh, you know, two car parking spaces per plot. Uh, others have spoken in depth about this. Um, so I won't I won't bore everybody with further details on this. But you know, these could be everywhere and and, and nowhere. Um, and I think we were, this was, some of these images were collated for a previous presentation we did. And we looked at who was building sort of the, the 175,000 homes that came forward, I think in 2000 and in 2021. And we found that over 50% of those was delivered by the largest 15 companies. So in terms of variety and diversity and a healthy competitive marketplace, um, we don't have that at all. Uh, it's very much um, a, a few house builders, we won't name them, but they have a monopoly on what gets built forward. And, um, you know, whilst there are certain subtle variations in things it's very much the same same stuff everywhere so i want to just talk about some research um that we we were uh, asked to do um for essex on improving walkability and uh, our our brief was very much looking at um challenging walking distances between new homes coming forward and uh existing or new amenities and we looked at the brief and we kind of said actually what we yes walkability is is uh, and, and closing down proximity is central to what we, we need to be thinking about. But in order to achieve this, you really need to be thinking about house types and block types because, um, you know, we don't, there are very few opportunities uh, at present to kind of build holistic new settlements. And so a lot of the way uh, places like Essex is, are growing is through incremental development of 100 homes here, um, 500 homes here, up to a thousand homes in 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 location and in another location, and and really the, the very few of those schemes can even support a a, a couple of corner shops, let alone um, a proper urban centre. So we need to be looking at how we can improve those sorts of schemes. Um, so we 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 took three case studies of what we'll call um, 
uh, the conventional de development types so different scales um, in different locations, different geographies, um, different sizes, and even a, a garden village, just to understand how uh, how places like Essex, which I think are very indicative of of most parts of the country, are currently growing. And hopefully, Anneli, this will you'll enjoy this um, land budget analysis that we did on all of these these schemes. So we um, we took a, a scheme. Uh, by um, Old Dunmo. Um, this got through an appeal, a thousand homes coming through an appeal, not seen by a design review panel, um, you know, brought forward using standard house types. Um, and we did a, a land budget analysis of um, the planning application drawings to demonstrate that uh, in line with your findings, um, around 25% of the total area is given over to the storage or movement of vehicles um houses that the actual places where people spend most of their time makes up almost a tenth of the site um and and you know back gardens and verges are a huge proportion and i think it's really important to make a distinction between useful green spaces that are productive that are uh, carbon sinks or you know enriching biodiversity and verges that are used because traffic engineers require setbacks and visibility displays um and all of this was to kind of to unpick the model uh, that dominates uh, most of the way, you know, 95% of housing comes forward and try to argue that both in terms of outcomes for people, for place, for for, for viability, there, there must be a better way forward. Um, and we, we created a kind of infrastructure ratio, which is a term um, used to, to, to refer to the amount of hard and loft, soft landscaping uh, required per dwelling to show that um, you know, to, to allow cross comparison of of um, of different sites, so you can see some of that data there, um, and then again, um, demonstrating that the way cars are integrated into plots is 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 quite challenging in terms of um, moving beyond thirty two dph. It's very difficult to to increase density if you're only ever using these building blocks, and that's why we, I think, as an industry, we do need to have a concerted. It's it's. I find it. Um, sort of disingenuous, I think, to have a conversation about density, walkability, if we're not talking about um, product types and, and, and house types, because without them, you can assemble these in slightly different ways, but you'll always end up with something that's low density and, and as a consequence, car dominated, because we don't have the vi vitality we need to kind of support other 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 uses. Um, and, and this is an image from, I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with it, from Boban in, uh, in Freiburg, which continuously uh, for, you know, a quarter century is held up as the sort of pantheon of, of or the, the, the epitome of, of what a car-free neighbourhood looks like. And, you know, it would be great if in five, ten years' time we had comparable examples in the UK that we could share and that were as widely celebrated as this as a sort of, you know... Um, way of living uh, with closer relationship to nature. And um, the, the team we were working with on this particular piece of research were very keen on learning from Vauban. And um, so we, we undertook a land budget analysis there, which showed, you know, because they've got parking garages and um, um, a lot of, a lot of the, um, Car parking provision is off-site. It's shared. It's pooled. Um, there's a, there are apartment buildings. It allows you to do. You know, it frees your hands so that twenty percent of of um, the, the sort of land budget is is occupied by buildings, and that doesn't reflect the fact that a lot of these are apartment buildings. So the uh, the intensity, the density of of and the way we're using the land is is even more productive than than this diagram shows. Um, we we really wanted this piece of work to be very practical and um, something that we could challenge a lot of the UK industry. So we wanted to kind of look at. Uh, obviously, there's no there's no comparable. I don't think of of what Vauban achieves in in the UK. So we wanted to look at sort of best practice UK examples of high density suburban living to demonstrate that another way is possible, and then harvest some of the best bits of those to. to kind of challenge some of the um, design constraints that Stephen and Annalie have described. So obviously, um, the first scheme we looked at was Goldsmith Street. Um, and we did we ran a, a comparable land budget analysis to show that, uh, you know, that the percentage of building is is so much higher. Um, there's, there's a greater proportion of footpaths. Um, back gardens, whilst much more compressed and and you know that compression is absolutely vital in terms of lifting the density. Uh, still make up a sizable proportion, as does um, 
the um uh, the as does sort of hard standing areas, which, you know, they are also amenity spaces. And I think parking, I think I saw anecdotally was talked about a lot in in the comments and is always a big challenge. But I think here, um, and interrupt me, Anneli, if I've got, we've got this wrong, but I think it's about 0 0.8, uh, a ratio of about 0 0.7, 0 0.8, which is achievable with a terrace form, which is one of the big constraints on delivering terrace housing, the need to kind of um, puncture your 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 uh your linear blocks with parking um so you know is there a way we can begin to sort of it's not in some ways it's quite low tech but um remembering what we've we've forgotten how to do and again the the, the amount of uh hard and soft landscape and you know verges and buffers minimal per home so it's that intensity um it, it's a far better use of land and you need to you know this there's far less stuff you have to bring forward it in order to support a single dwelling um i won't Anneli, i won't go go too much over this because there's a few things to, to we want to share i mean this is a um another scheme uh, in somerset called lime 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 street square it's uh, um about 10 years old now but it follows a similar pattern of uh blocks orientated uh north north south for maximum um so again um they have in, in in this scheme though they have uh, sort of garages integrated to allow um, one on plot park car parking space, um, and again uh, highly efficient. Um, and and the interesting thing here is there's um, some non allocated spaces that run sort of um, perpendicular to the blocks, so it allows for giraffes and uh, landscaping that is you know for 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 different uses. Um, and again, the the infrastructure required is is much more efficient than the traditional um, house builder approach. And you you're able to build; they're actually able to deliver quite substantial um, green spaces in 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 the middle of the scheme. Um, Knights Park, a, a similar um, range of benefits: super high density, the integration of apartment blocks uh, alongside some terrace housing, and and then quite efficient um, and interesting. Uh, house types that um, have sort of, if I flip to this page, have um, houses fronting a, a totally car-free scheme, and then um, and then have uh, flats over garages to the to the rear. So not dissimilar to the example that um, Stephen shared at Abode. Um, and then finally, um, talking about Abode, the the, um, the the fact that we don't need to have um, sort of that there are multiple ways of doing this where house build houses are perpendicular to um uh, uh the streets and that creates a new sense of interest and and and, and townscape so this was all of this was to demonstrate that there is a range of, of possibilities out there and we can um we can both bring forward you know lots of different alternatives to the to the standard house builder model um and we've, we've backed that up with with data which shows that um you know on in, in terms of land budget there are more efficient ways to use sites that we're bringing forward um and then what we did to kind of really drive home that message we took the first uh, scheme that we shared and we we redrew it very crudely uh not in a way that's intended to to sort of really win any you know as a, as a place making exercise but just a crude reinterpretation of that block structure um with a tighter more compact block which demonstrated there was a an uplift in in homes by by more than 20 percent um and then some of the uh the benefits of that could then go into you know more affordable housing, higher quality public realm, higher quality materiality. Um, so a, a, a range of benefits, really. And then some overarching sort of lessons learned for some of some of this stuff. Um, you know, I think a lot of the conventional de development model has very much been predicated on um, individual plots for sale where your your house, your, your, your home, uh, the play provision, the parking provision are all on one plot, whereas uh, something more progressive might look to blend that that kind of ownership across the street and across the block. So you have obviously some amenity space uh, within your plot, possibly a couple of spaces rather than concentrating it in, in one space, which again, what Stephen mentioned, um, but then you blur that to the street. So this play and unallocated car parking on, on, on the street, which, um, which makes things, which bring, br brings up densities and, and uh, looks at, at providing more sort of positive social outcomes as well. Uh, back to back distances we've we've spoken about, so I, I won't go into that again. But needless to say, there are better ways of 
providing back gardens you know the the standard 22 meters um between habitable rooms you know at, or you like it doesn't take a, a, a at any half decent architect can find a way of avoiding overlooking without having to rely on 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 22 meter back to back distances and a crude measure of distance doesn't really take into consideration quality of private immunity so on the left you have a kind of funny shaped garden which um clad in in b and q fences which is a term i'm definitely going to use uh from now on um you know which isn't isn't exactly very usable and then there are multitude of of different ways of providing immunity possibly in one location or stacked or blurred or you know all of which which look at tighter ways of creating blocks and 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 uplifting density and walkability um again there's a there's a, often a presumption that um rear gardens uh, automatically create a sort of more uh, biodiverse environments. And whilst that might be true for sort of environments that are highly, um, that are that are um, uh, long established, um, new gardens tend to be, to tend to not perform as well, especially when grass is removed and they're replaced with artificial turf. So it's again, something to, to consider. Um, form factor, which Anali touched upon, um, you know, comparing Goldsmith Street to standard house builder approach. Um, it's This conversation is completely non-existent in terms of uh, a, a lot of the, the vast majority of housing coming forward. And uh, n neither is is sort of aspect and um, solar gain. So a lot of that, um, there's a lot of room to kind of improve that and use that as a driving force as people are much more conscious of energy bills to promote denser forms of housing. Um, so then a very quick series of um, illustrations to, to, to show this was these were set out for a for a local authority who wanted some support on promoting um, getting house builders to, to, to work better. So uh, a notional development next to a um, an existing urban settlement. Um, you know, we, we start um, with reinforcing uh, existing green assets because often ex agricultural land, which is a lot of these schemes are on, don't tend to be you know super biodiverse. It's it, uh, unilaterally. It, it, it's often the hedges, the, the green assets that need reinforcing. Um, so using that as your sort of principal starting position and, and structuring position, um, looking at opportunities for retrofit where there are existing heritage assets, um, concentrating new uses, new mixed uses. So, you know, with hybrid working um, uh, being now being the norm, there are more opportunities for non-residential uses, I think, in 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 sort of uh, residential led schemes. So positioning those in relation to existing communities so you're, you're looking at bringing places together rather than creating siloed neighborhoods um having compact housing blocks with with low form factors that are uh, have a, a lighter footprint on on um on the land and then looking at 10 years beyond market sale which we have haven't had time to talk about today because there's so much else to talk about but community land tufts even built to rent i think offer like huge potential for sort of challenging the idea the notion that every house must have two cars and um and and dismantling some of the issues around legacy um and and stewardship um and then you know knitting that all together to to create places that are um vibrant dense and 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 walkable and i'll leave it there Thanks a lot, Jess. I mean, lots of positive feedback on the chat. It's great analysis and, you know, really pinpoints all the, all the issues that we need to address and suggestions of how to do that. Um, I mean, I think there, there's, I mean, I will pose a question to the kind of speakers in a moment about how you have overcome some of the challenges. I mean, in the chat, secure by design, minimum garden standards, adoption standards have all been mentioned. And, I guess to overcome these, it probably needs a kind of the softer skills as well. And um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you have managed to kind of turn people around in a way and overcome those challenges. Um, because in a way, I mean, what I would really like to achieve at some point that it is easy to deliver these schemes. I think at the moment, there are more kind of challenges stacked up against them unfortunately and it's hard work to kind of get them delivered so it would be great if at some point we are in a world where actually it's easy to do these things and difficult to do the other things the ones that um you know are not sustainable and don't create the healthy places we want to 
I think there are also some lessons in here about for for the kind of urban designers, master planners who are working on the earlier stages on policy documents, master plans, design codes, and so on. And it's about, you know, the orientation of buildings, thinking about different parking strategies as well. I mean, one person mentioned on the chat that, you know, in some areas they are not well connected, they do need cars. And um, I guess it's about kind of clustering the car parks in, in areas, like a bit like the Vauban example that just mentioned. So you don't have individual houses all needing their cars or integrating them into the built form, like in Stephen's example. So there are ways that, you know, we can overcome these challenges. Um, so before I go back to the speakers, I think we, we have a kind of questionnaire for you all, because, I mean, I think we've heard a lot of challenges of why it is difficult to deliver this. I would like to hear from you what you think are the main challenges of actually delivering the schemes we have seen today on a day-to-day -day basis everywhere, easily. Um, what are the barriers? And because that will give also the UDG something to kind of like address and where do we put our efforts as well? Um, so while I think Robert will pull up the questionnaire, then if I go back first, maybe to Stephen about like, you know, the challenges, what have you done to overcome them? I think, yeah. I think, I think one of the, the questions is about um, the ginnels. Um, we've not built one yet, um, but um, we have, you know, the green lanes at Great Night. And I don't think they were ever questioned in terms of secure by design. And I think it's sort of interesting that, you know, you could start to level the sort of idea of a Radburn plan on, onto those green lanes um, if you were a mind. But actually, I think it's just the way that the grain works, the, those spaces interconnect with streets. Um, there's very good overlooking of those spaces. So I don't, I, you know, I think it's, a, it's about that sort of natural surveillance um, and being able to demonstrate that you've overcome the principles behind some of the legislation. Um, and I think sometimes, perhaps, as a, as a profession, we don't question those enough. And we don't sort of, uh, it, we have to understand why they're there, but the principles can be achieved in, in many different ways. Thank you. And I know on, on particular on Great Night and Aboda, you all said, lengthy discussions with the highway authorities and just before you were chatting you were what was your way of getting the refuse controlling the refuse vehicles <laughs> very, very well, i mean it's, it was interesting <laughs> of course when when great night was was built it was probably one of the earlier um shared surface um, neighborhoods and so we had to work very closely with the highways department um you know the first the first highway engineer solution was of course the the uh, a road with two pavements um everywhere and um which is is something that the client really didn't want uh, we wanted to make a much more sort of shared streets if we could and so we had to just take the highways department through it it was quite a long process it was the same with with um things like sort of the the fire brigade um uh, to to make sure that they could get their very large vehicles round but though you know in in the end once you sort of worked with them they were very very helpful and came up with very good suggestions of what happens in practice and it's sometimes that what happens in practice isn't what's re reflected in the legislation thank you i mean we also work very closely of course with the the um urban designers and the planners in Cambridge. And it was very much a, di a really strong dialogue. I mean, there's been a lot of discussions about sort of local planning authorities, but it was a very um, productive um, discussion with the, with the um, local authority. Um, and they, they proved very supportive of some of the ideas and, and again, thought of ways of, of assisting with, with delivering those aspirations. Yeah, I think um, high aspirations in, in, in the clients and the local authorities, they go a long way, isn't it? As Annalise said, a, a great brief is, is just something everybody kind of, you know, every urban designer architect looks forward to. Um, Annalise, what, how did you overcome some of those policy or kind of standard challenges? We didn't have to deal with secure by design. Um, I'm well, sure back-to-back back distances, that sort of thing. Well, 
we won the competition with this idea. So that was the council. They were all involved in choosing us. Um, so there was a will to find solutions to things. I think, I think that, you know, we, we are, all the buildings are facing the same way. So, um, there was just a couple of issues in the flats that we need to need to sort out, but they agreed that similar bedrooms could face similar bed, similar rooms. So bedrooms could face bedrooms, living rooms could face living rooms less. So they worked with us, um, on those. Um, and we had an amazing highways engineer who allowed us to make a three and a half meter wide road and people have to wait and, you know, pull in and let people pass, which is probably what we're used to in London, um, that, you know, we can operate perfectly well, but he he agreed to that. So we can slow traffic down. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really unusual. I haven't come across anyone like him again. It's a constant battle. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I think everybody on the call today will kind of take up that button and continue that battle. Um, shall we kind of do the um, questions now? And I think this is really um, so asking and, you know, can you all put in what you think? Like, you know, what do you think are the top challenges and barriers to prevent us from delivering the quality of housing we have seen today everywhere as a kind of standard product? And, um, you know, land prices, construction costs, we have a um, planning policy, we've heard about back-to-back -back distances, overlooking distances, building racks. I mean, you know, they are they kind of stronger now in terms of energy, which is good at some point. Then we have highway adoption standards. Um, and we talked a little bit about the commercial approaches by national house builders and the widespread use of standard house types is that a good thing is that one of the key barriers and i mean consumer preference i've kind of we've put that in because i mean i've often been faced with um arguing or discussing with developers saying like oh our customers don't want to buy this um you know long terraces houses are regimented and boring and nobody wants to live in them so i mean these are the kind of things we hear on a day-to-day -day basis, but I mean, what 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 does everybody think? So we've got eighty-two people are doing this. So while while you are kind of filling that in, we still have a few people to go. Um, I just want to remind you, and there was actually a question about higher density housing as well. So in our mini series, the next event, as I mentioned before, 17th of May next week um, on the Wednesday, where we have a kind of general reflection on housing. And we will hear from Ben Dabesha uh, kind of reflecting on his many years in delivering housing, as well as from um, the kind of Quality of Life Foundation about kind of how they use their standards to embed that into neighborhoods. And then on the 1st of June, um, we have a similar webinar to today, but talking about higher density types, house types like blocks with deck access, mentioned blocks, and so on. Um, so that is being set up, and you can already book your tickets, and we are in the process of confirming more speakers. And then we also have already organized on 19th of June, the Better Street Summit, so that will look at the bits between the homes and between the buildings and focus on that. So have we got 65% of the participants have answered? Um, nothing, oh, yes, it's still moving a little bit, but I think some of the speakers might have gone away to get, grab a cup of tea or something. Yes, I think we might stop this here. Yeah, nothing moving. Um, Robert, what do I have to do? Just say stop sharing. <laughs> yeah, if you want me to take the thing down, I'll take it down. Okay. Okay, has everybody read that? We'll, we'll um, circulate this after the, um, after the share. So it's, oh, oh, sorry, I've kind of lost you all there for a moment. So, I mean, it's quite interesting to see that 
I mean, obviously, the group doesn't think it's consumer preference. That's not an issue. Lack of design skills doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, but the kind of the building regulations, highways, adoption standards is, is key. Then the house builder kind of operational commercial approaches um, tops the list and then followed by standard house types and also the kind of, I guess, the lack of ambition by councillors or planning authorities. Or I mean, it, it, it can be lack of ambition, but sometimes in many areas, I think it's also um, confidence of demanding things and actually feeling that they're able to demand better quality from developers. I think that's something we see in particular in kind of, let's say, the less affluent areas, and which was also supported by Matthews Camona's um, research recently, um, that the quality of housing is kind of less good in less affluent areas. And I think that has to do a lot with confidence in the local authorities as well, in terms of demanding things and holding people to account. So I think Thank you for your input in the, into this, and we will take it away and see how we can build that into our program. Yeah. Oh, but I can't get rid of this screen, but anyway. Did everybody see the results? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's close that up now. Um, so, I think, well, 2.30 on the dot. Any last words from the speakers? Otherwise, no? Okay. Well, thanks a lot for kind of joining us um, to kind of share your expertise, knowledge, and um, research projects. And thank you for everybody on the call. Thanks for the audience. I mean, lots of people attended, and I hope you found it useful, and you will take away the kind of lessons learned and we will share this webinar kind of for future re uh, reference on the on the platform at UDG website as always so thanks a lot and hopefully see you next week have a good afternoon thank you Bye.